How's it going you guys? Today in this video I am going to be distilling some of the top most ridiculous claims that are made by these anti-meat gurus, okay? And these are some of the worst arguments that are made in the vegan circles and it's mostly from the spiritual raw vegan crowd uh, that a lot of these come from. Uh, so I'm going to be covering topics like the body needs to be alkaline because we're magnetic electrical creatures and uh, meat rots in your intestine and it creates it, it creates mucus and you have to detox the vomita and uh, mucus cleansing for the soul and uh, spiritual intoxication of the meta you know like the karmic debt of meat of meat eating you you you, uh, you, you evil lion eating that meat to survive. Your comic debt will be the end of you. And the whole uh, stress hormone transfer thing. So those are the things we're going to be talking about. Uh, so let's start with alkalinity. All right, so let's talk about alkalinity. So the first red flag when we deal with some of these uh, gurus is when they say the body needs to be alkaline. The reason why this is a red flag is because uh, different parts of the body require different levels of acidity or alkalinity. Uh, the pH of different parts of the body is going to vary depending on what area of the body is in question. So I made a video like years ago, back in 2016, talking about that. I, I've made videos in 2017, 2018, I've made many videos about this. Um, different parts of the body require different pH, okay, so the blood needs to be uh, neutral to slightly alkaline, okay? Uh, the stomach needs to be highly acidic. In fact, uh, a healthy stomach pH is going to be anywhere from 1 to 2, which is highly acidic. It's the same level of acidity. We have the same stomach acidity as a, a vulture or a hyena, a scavenger creature, which has enough stomach acid to neutralize, uh, to digest rotten dead flesh out in the wilderness, for example. So our stomach needs a high amount of acidity and that's also to um, keep pathogenic bacteria and fungal infections, things like candida in check. So if you alkalize your stomach with things like um, uh, baking soda, for example, people take that to prevent cancer and whatnot, all you're gonna do is uh, alkalize your stomach, you're gonna create chronic digestive problems, especially digesting meat and protein, and you're going to create an alkaline environment in the stomach, which needs to be acidic, and that's gonna lead to chronic infections of the stomach. So, um, so you know, the small intestine, like the intestine requires a, um, a varying pH as well. Um, the, the saliva needs to be slightly alkaline or neutral and you know the list goes on and on um, and so that's the first red flag is if they overgeneralize the entire body as needing to be alkaline they don't have a clue what they're talking about so I think what I think what they mean is that the blood needs to be alkaline and so the thing is it is true it is a fact it is a scientifically proven fact that uh, the blood pH hardly changes at all because uh, anytime you eat, anytime your body uh, kind of comes, uh, throws off the pH, anytime the pH is thrown off uh, at all, the body will um, regulate that by pulling uh, alkaline minerals from the bone or acidic minerals depending on what you know part of the body needs to be changed. And so um, there are a lot of experts who believe that uh, you know when your b body's producing acidic compounds like uric acid or even keto acids, um, some experts think that it can lead to lowered bone density over time uh, by pulling calcium out of the bone to neutralize the acidity. Uh, some people believe that uh, it's essential to consume a large amount of alkaline minerals uh, to balance out blood acidity, to take some of the strain off of the kidneys for any potential, uh, you know, harm of regulating the blood pH over time. But that's a very complicated uh, piece of biochemistry that these alkaline diet gurus aren't talking about. They aren't talking about 
the actual possible effects of acidity. Uh, they're talking, they think that if you eat meat, it's going to acidify the body and create cancer growth or something. Because uh, the body cannot survive in an alkaline environment. Uh, the fact of the matter is, there's plenty of people who have actually put cancer into remission on ketogenic diets. Uh, I interviewed my one of my really good friends a couple of weeks ago, actually. His name's Leukemia Slayer. You should watch the interview. And he's kept cancer into remission uh, ever since on a ketogenic diet. He's been off of uh, cancer medications forever. And uh, he just actually today got tested again and came back uh, negative for cancer. So... Um, yeah, that, that whole thing with, uh, acidity causing cancer is ridiculous as well. Uh, if you do have, and see, so there is a clinical name for an acidic environment in the body. It's called metabolic acidosis. If you have metabolic acidosis, guess where your acidosis is going to end up? Your acidosis is going to be in the hospital because metabolic acidosis is a extremely severe and dangerous health problem and typically people don't develop like clinical symptoms of metabolic acidosis unless they have um, like kidney problems kidney failure or you know diabetes or some type of extreme health problem but if you're not like passing out or vomiting uncontrollably or um, experiencing severe symptoms of metabolic acidosis, then your body's not, you know, overly acidic or whatever. And it's impossible for the whole body to be overly acidic. We're talking about the blood here, okay? So these people who push these, this alkaline theory, this idea of al the alkaline theory of cancer growth and diseases all come from uh, acid, an acidic environment, they don't even know a jack shit about al alkaline balance in the body. So um, be very, very careful about these uh, alkaline diet people. The next one is meat rots in your intestine. So no, meat does not rot in your intestine. Actually, uh, when you eat animal flesh, it doesn't actually even uh, enter the intestines in the way that plant foods do. Uh, meat is actually mostly digested by stomach acid and pepsin in the stomach, okay? And so we actually have um, clinical evidence from, um, you know, uh, is it gastric, gastric bypass uh, patients, I believe, where basically they do a procedure where they remove a part of the intestine and you can actually see uh, the food move from the stomach into the colon through a tube. And what you'll find on these patients who have this procedure done is that meat is actually um, turned to mush, it's turned to liquid in the stomach. It's completely broken down by enzymes in the stomach. Whereas plant foods, including brown rice and uh, you know uh, broccoli and, and fruits and vegetables, they are, well, with the exception of some fruits, um, they're actually chewed and then they enter the stomach the same way that you chewed them and they don't change shape or, or digest until they hit the stomach or until they hit the intestine. And then when plant foods hit the intestine, they actually ferment um, by bacteria. They te technically plant foods rot in your intestine and that is why they, you know, they, you know, we, there's also talk about plant foods and fiber for the gut microbiome. It's because humans can't really digest cellulose or, um, you know, these, the, the fiber that's in these fruits and vegetables. And so it's actually broken down by bacteria in the intestine since we can't digest them. And so um, I'm not even going to get into its effects on constipation. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so essentially meat is mostly digested in the stomach um, and plant foods are in, uh, digested by bacteria in the intestine. So if you, uh, technically plant foods rot in the intestine. But again, that just because, you know, when you use words like rot, it makes it sound worse than it actually is. Um, but uh, yeah, plant foods are digested by bacteria in the intestine. That can actually be beneficial because the fermenting of um, fiber in the intestine for plant foods, when plant foods rot in your intestine, 
they can actually produce um, you know beneficial uh, molecules, things like uh, short chain fatty acids, which many people believe are healthy for the gut. Um, and uh, certain polyphenols and things can produce nutrients and other compounds, which some people believe are beneficial to health. So yeah, plant foods rot in the intestine and rotting in the intestine doesn't really mean it's a bad thing. But meat doesn't rot in your intestine unless you have an alkaline stomach. <laughs> like a lot of these uh, alkaline diet people want to have. It's ridiculous. Um, and so I didn't write this one down, but uh, I'm going to put this one next. Um, so uh, these gurus who compare humans to herb herbivores, especially chimpanzees and gorillas. Look, okay, so they say things like, yeah, man, like um, you should eat like a gorilla because gorillas are the strongest animals in the you know animal kingdom. Okay, like, you know, uh, if you want to get big and buff and strong like a gorilla, then you should, then what do gorillas eat, huh? Where do gorillas eat, get their protein from, huh? Plants. Well, so the diet of most uh, great apes other than humans, it actually involves tree bark, um, you know, leaves, you know, some fruit, depending on which one we're talking about. A lot of plants that if humans try to eat, we would probably die of intestinal blockages. Uh, so if you really want to eat like a fucking gorilla, why are you buying uh, all your food from a grocery store when there's plenty of trees outside where you can, you can eat like a gorilla. You can go out to a tree, take some tree bark and start snacking on it, okay? And eat the ants that come along with it because a huge part of a lot of these great apes diet are some of the insects and the bugs that come along with the plants that they're eating. Um, <laughs> so go ahead, eat some tree bark, eat some leaves from a tree and see what the fuck happens. Beyond that, um, humans cannot digest cellulose, okay? So most herbivorous animals, they actually have the enzyme cellulase, which is required for digesting cellulose. And they can actually um, consume these uh, leaves and things and grass and convert the cellulose into usable energy. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but um, herbivores, they're eating these plants and they're converting the fiber and the cellulose content into fat, okay? Uh, so technically, um, if we look at the net energy being produced from the, their, their diet, they're actually running on a 60 to 70% fat diet through the conversion of these uh, plant foods into short-chain uh, short fatty acids, especially you know the ruminant animals that turn grass into energy in the gut and things like that. But uh, so, you could say that they're on a ketogenic diet, but it doesn't really matter. The point here is that we're not fucking gorillas, we're not cows, okay, uh, clearly. And uh, I don't think many people would want to have the distended stomachs and things that these uh, herbivorous animals have. Um, our, there's, there's many differences in our gut, in our digestive system, in our brains that are extremely different from these great apes, especially like a gorilla. And one of the best, uh, one of my favorite resources that I like to introduce people who are just completely misinformed to um, the differences between herbivorous animals and humans and why human beings should be eating a mostly meat diet is the lecture by Dr. Michael Eads, that's E-A-D-E-S, um, it's called Paleoontology and the Origins of the Paleo Diet, okay? And he's been giving this talk for years and it goes into depth on, uh, there's vegetarian societies that had uh, very high rates of obesity and heart disease. In particular, the Egyptians who ate mostly a whole grain diet that was very low in, in fat and uh, presents all the evidence for all of these claims and everything and it does talk a lot about these uh, you know, great apes and their digestive systems compared to humans. For anybody who really wants solid evidence and is actually interested in figuring out the truth, um, that's a really good place to start. Um, it goes into such depth that I can't even begin to explain it all here in this video that was supposed to be a lot shorter than it actually is. But yeah, newsflash motherfuckers, we're not gorillas. So um, 
good luck trying to get all of your nutri nutrients from grass, leaves, and uh, all these other foods that these herbivorous animals eat. Not the hybridized food, uh, plant foods that human beings have been creating uh, over the last thousand years or so. The next thing is uh, mucus cleansing, okay? So, uh, so again, so first of all, if you have mucus in your stool, that's typically a sign of irritable bowel syndrome. And what that, the mucus is, is, a, is a, the body's vehicle for transporting bacteria and pathogens out, um, out of the body. And so an infection in the gut is a typical cause of mucus in the stool, among many other causes. But um, if you're shitting out mucus, okay, and so a lot of these anti-meat gurus, they claim that meat causes mucus production, which makes no sense. There's no physiological mechanism in how that's even possible. They claim that meat rots in your intestine and it, cre and it creates mucus over time. That's not even, none of that's true. I already debunked the meat rotting in the intestine nonsense. Uh, it, there's no way, there's no link between digesting meat and then turns into mucus somehow. Now, one of the reasons why they say this is because these people typically recommend um, raw vegan diets um, and they'll recommend water fasting or dry fasting. And you see people like Tim Sheaf, for example, okay, they're on these really extreme diets and they're doing extreme protocols. And when they, and they find when they starve themselves of vital nutrients and they go on these extreme diets, vegan diets, uh, these raw vegan diets in particular, regular vegan diets, not nearly as problematic as these raw vegan diets. And these uh, long-term fasts, they find that they start to, to um, shit mucus and mucus comes out of their eyes and they start to produce a lot of mucus. Well, guess what guys? When you starve yourself and you're chronically malnourished, lots of crazy things start to happen and mucus production is probably one of them. So if you're wondering why mucus is coming out of your asshole when you're on a long-term uh, extreme diet or protocol, it's not because you're cleansing or detoxing. It's because you're malnourishing yourself and starving to death, okay? And so they claim it's because they're cleansing the body of the, of the rotten meat. That's not fucking true. <laughs> That's not true. And it's like they have these schizophrenic ideas of what's happening that are not in line with, you know, physiology or science or any common sense whatsoever or, you know, whatever. And then the deficiencies in nutrients create more schizophrenia and delusions. And it's a never ending cycle until hopefully one day they can snap out of it. Um, you know, even a cooked vegan diet is gonna prevent this from happening. But uh, yeah, I don't have mucus production. Cooked vegans usually don't have mucus problems unless they have Crohn's disease, which a vegan diet is probably not very good for that, no matter what. But it's only these raw vegans and these juice cleansing people that tend to get this mucus problem. So, <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. I'm, I'm feeling healthier than I've ever felt in my life. And when I was vegan for a year, believe me, I did not feel so good. And in fact, when I was doing, when I was vegan, I actually did have some mucus in my stool at one point. Um, but I was taking milk thistle at the time. So, whatever. So then the next uh, crazy thing that goes on, they claim, is uh, spiritual energy intoxication. Now basically, when you eat meat, you're transferring the karmic energy from the animal flesh into your soul. Uh, so first of all, can you please show me some kind of evidence for a soul existing? Now, I mean, it's cool to think about these things and, you know, just because there's no evidence doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But when you're making health claims and giving people health advice and you're basing a, a, you know, health around this idea of the soul and the spirit that you have no evidence for, now you're beginning, now you're creating problems. You're creating, pro, you're creating logical fallacies. Um, you're possibly uh, recommending harmful things to some people that might need to eat meat in their diet. Um, and, you know, most of these people are deluded into thinking that anybody and everybody can eat a, a vegan diet uh, with no health problems. And that's not true at all, as I had to figure out the hard way. 
and I was in denial for so long. Um, so they think that everyone can eat a vegan diet. So they don't, they're in denial of the fact that some people might need to eat meat in order to solve a chronic health problem. And so they think that there's this karmic debt, like if you eat an animal that was killed, then your karma is going to kill you forever. And in the next life, you're going to suffer. Okay, so um, this whole idea of karma is based on the idea that there's, some, that there's objective good and bad. But technically, ethics and good and bad are a subjective um, uh, so social agreement that we all agree upon in our society. And so it has nothing to do with like objective things like health outcomes, health measures, um, you know, mechanisms in the body and stuff like that. Uh, karma is completely a um, man-made concept that has no grounding in objective reality. Um, and to take this a step further, so if a cheetah eats a, um, a gazelle, does that mean that the cheetah now is karmically doomed? Why? Its natural diet is to eat the gazelle. That's a circle of life. Um, killing another animal, even if like that's your natural biological uh, means of survival. That is that that's karmic debt. Should a cheetah or a lion go vegan to save itself from karma? The only way that this idea works is if you firmly believe that human beings are are not meant to eat meat or if we don't need meat for our survival. And you know, the evidence is very clear that human beings have, you know, we've hunt, we've hunted megafauna into extinction. Uh, we survived the Ice Age somehow. How do we survive the Ice Age um, with no, uh, with, not, with, a, with very limited access to these plant foods? Um, uh, you know, the stone tools, the, the carvings and markings on these animal bones and things uh, that are directly linked to humans killing these animals for survival. Um, all the indigenous cultures in the world, uh, you know, consuming a diet that's high in animal foods. I mean, that. Like this can go on and on and on, but if you watch that uh, that lecture by Dr. Michael Eads, Paleontology and the Origins of the Paleo Diet, you will see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, it seems to me like at the very least, there's a large body of evidence that shows human beings were meant to eat meat for a very long time. And I'll tell you this, uh, I tried surviving on a vegan diet for an entire year and Oh my God, uh, I would die if I had to try that again. And I tried everything to make that work. But you know, these people are in denial. Like they, if I tell them that they're going to like, it, they just can't accept it. They're going to come with all these excuses. So the point is, it's pretty hard to argue that it's car. It's, it's negative karma to eat meat. Um, when it's biologically necessary for an organism's survival. Um, and, you know, it's always context dependent, okay? If you're stranded on an island and all you, have to, all you have to eat is another animal or something and you really don't have any edible plants on that island, are you going to, like, you know, just starve to death in the name of karma? It's a, it's a, it's a philosophical subjective debate, okay? Um, and a lot of people, so, and when it, I don't even want to get into this whole karma thing, but it's, to me, it seems like it is a very clear thing people tell themselves for comfort. Like if somebody wrongs them, they're like, oh, karma, karma will get them back. I don't have to worry about it because karma will do that for me. It's just an, a way to release stress. You know, it's just like, oh, God will take care of it. Like, it's not an actual thing. <laughs> Um, so let's see, stress hormone transfer. People say when you eat meat, um, that you're consuming the cortisol for, and the adrenaline that the animal released at the time of slaughter. So, um, I've seen zero, uh, tissue samples or intervention trials that, uh, show evidence for cortisol or adrenal hormones being transferred in meat or even lasting in the meat tissue itself after slaughter. So the only thing that I've seen is, uh, so when you kill an animal 
when they kill an animal and the animal is conscious of it, uh, the meat might become tougher as uh, because the muscles tense up or whatever. And that's the closest thing I've seen. There's been zero, there's zero lab data showing the presence of cortisol or adrenaline inside the muscle tissue. In fact, I don't even think that that's possible to have these hormones in muscle tissue after slaughter. Uh, it, res it resigns mostly in the nervous system as far as I know. So maybe the brain, if you eat the brain or the spinal cord of the animal, maybe, but not, not the muscle tissue. Um, what was the other thing? Um, so yeah, I mean, I haven't seen any evidence that suggests this is true. I, and most, pretty much everything on this list that people claim, these are just things people come up with. You know, they don't have any evidence for it. These are things people hear from other gurus or they come up with in the shower. These are not things that, you know, have any like actual objective evidence for. Uh, let's see. Um, there's the heart disease and cancer increase uh, claim. Now that's something I'm going to have to address in another video since this video is almost 30 minutes long. Um, so listen, you guys, if you hear anyone making these claims, like, you know, especially the things like the body needs to be alkaline or, um, uh, meat rots in your intestine <laughs> or, um, you've got to cleanse the body of the mucus <laughs> or, um, you need to detox the body with the bentonite clay or, <laughs> Oh, but human beings are, uh, we're electrical humans. <laughs> like we're Magneto from Spider-Man or something. Like, when you hear people making these fucking claims, <laughs> like for me, for me personally, I wonder how anybody can fall for this. But I, I think, you know, again, for one, this is coming from somebody who's, who owns like a hundred textbooks and reads them for fun. And has been, you know, nose deep in scientific studies, you know, in a serious fashion for four years. But I've been studying health for much longer. So, um, and I did kind of fall victim to the raw vegan bullshit back in like 2014. And I quickly had a reality check when I realized these plant foods were actually what was causing my chronic psoriasis and irritable, irritable, irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, as well as my breathing issues and anxiety and many other problems. Uh, <laughs> but most people, they don't have the body of knowledge that I have, and so they're more susceptible to the bullshit. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, post your questions in the comments down below, and if you need any clarification, let me know. Uh, that was the top seven things vegan gurus don't want you to know about. <laughs>